Welcome to this episode of TCA Remote Learning. You can find more episodes on remote learning at tcea.org forward slash remote hyphen learning. My name is Miguel Gulen. I'm a Director of Professional Development for TCA. Find me on Twitter at mglearn. Let's talk a little bit about today's topic, matching digital tools with evidence-based strategies. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into Dr. John Hattie's work, but also talk a little bit about how we can match digital tools in ways that will enhance those particular strategies. To get started, what we're going to do is take a quick look at a video, and we're going to watch it together. We're not going to watch the, the whole video, but just a, a part that introduces John Hattie's work. You can certainly watch the entire video on your own if you like. Here we go. One of the first things we need to do as we get ready to talk about the teaching strategy we're going to focus on this year in the Empower program is to look at what the research says. We always want to back up what we're doing with sound research. We know that in education today there are a ton of research studies that come out almost every day. So it can be difficult to know what's good research and what's bad research. John Hattie says that in education almost everything that we try to do is good and is done for the right reasons. But what we need to do is really look at what gives us the biggest bang for our buck, for our time, and for our students. So in order to do that, let's talk about the different types of research studies that there are. Um, starting down at the bottom with a case report. If um, someone comes to you and says, I have a case report that says this particular piece of software has an effect size of 0.2 and it's going to increase reading scores by a hundred percent well that sounds really good the question you have to ask yourself is what's a case report and a case report is uh, when you take two three four five kids and you have them in the study and then you publish those results so it's a very limited base of individuals and you can see all the different types of studies there, but what we're looking for is at the top, the meta-analysis. A meta-analysis looks at multiple studies, all sorts of different studies that have been done on that topic, and it combines all of those results and comes up with an effect size. The easy way to remember that about a meta-analysis is more is better. The more studies done, the more reliable the research is. John Hattie um, is a researcher, and he has written a number of books over the years, starting with Visible Learning, um, where he talks about everything that we do in education. And what Hattie did for the past 25 years, he has looked at more than 1,500 meta-analyses with more than 90,000 educational studies that involved more than 300 million students from around the world. So his research is valid. It has a very large base. It's over time and it includes so many different studies. And what he was trying to determine was what makes the biggest difference in accelerating student learning. So this is definitely something we want to pay attention to. And what he came up with was the effect size of a whole bunch of different strategies. So you'll notice down here in the bottom of the screen, you see the red area. And it says if you are below zero, you have an effect size of below zero, that actually means that students exposed to that strategy will lose learning. Okay, it's a bad thing. They're actually going to lose learning. If you have an effect size of zero to 0.15, that's the same amount of learning that a student would get by not going to school at all, but just maturing over the course of a year. Okay. If you look in the orange section, that's from a 0.515 effect size to a 0.4 effect size. That's the same amount of learning you would expect to see over a year of learning for students. Okay. So anything that is a below a 0.4, that really doesn't have that big an effect. So if someone comes to you and says, I have a new textbook and it has a 0.32 effect size, 
you're gonna go, don't really care because that's what we're gonna accomplish just by having the kid go to school for a year anyway. What we want is anything that's greater than 0.4 for an effect size. That means it's gonna have more influence on accelerating student learning than anything else, okay? So the easy way for me to remember it is I'm looking for anything that's 0.5 or above, but anything above 0.4 is what we wanna look at for an effect size. So what Hattie did then, once he'd established the effect... So let's stop right there and take a look at some of the different kinds of strategies, the different evidence-based strategies or what we call high effect size strategies that uh, are greater than 0 0.40. So it, as uh, Lori Gracie pointed out in this, in this video that she uh, created, which presents an overview of John Hattie's work, we could see that we're looking for effect sizes or strategies that have an effect size of over 0 0.40 that are greater than 0 0.40. Now it's important to not get caught up just in the effect size and how how large it is or, or how it accelerates student learning, how a strategy could accelerate student learning because these strategies have to be used at the appropriate time when students are learning. That means you can't just use any strategy you have to use the right one that matches where students are at in the learning. And so the way to understand this is to think about these strategies as falling into several categories. For example, surface, deep, and transfer learning. So when you think about surface strategies, we're talking about um, strategies that introduce students to concepts. And I'm going to go into it a little bit more uh, further down here, but it's I just want to emphasize that if you try to use a surface strategy when you're trying to uh, get students to engage in either deep or transfer learning, you're not going to get the result you expect or, or hope for for students. So as Hattie, Fisher, and Fry uh, point out, it's important to match the right approach, the right strategy, with, in, with the appropriate phase of learning, surface, deep, or transfer. Now there are some strategies that apply to all, uh, all learning that happens, uh, but let's take a quick look at surface learning. So sometimes people get the idea that surface learning does not mean, or, or means superficial learning, but that's not the case. Um, surface learning is, is when students are initially exposed to concepts, skills, and strategies. And it's considered foundational learning. Now as students build this foundation, they can, you can start to take advantage of deep learning strategies. And this is when students are consolidating their understanding and extending their surface learning knowledge. Transfer learning is that point when students take their consolidated knowledge and skills and apply that to a new scenario or context. So let's explore some of these. So there are some strategies, as I mentioned earlier, that sort of apply to all sorts of learning. Uh, let's just, for lack of a label, let's call them core, core strategies or core factor strategies. These include strategies like teacher credibility, success criteria, teacher clarity and you are certainly welcome to come back and explore the links that are that are on this resource page but to give you an example I'm just going to uh, share about space versus masked practice think about your time in high school and think about when you had a test coming up and you didn't really set aside time to study over a period of time how did you do on the test you may have aced the test you may have done really well or you may have bombed it but as you look at the effect size for space versus masked practice, let's look at it in terms of Leslie, Leanne, and Nora's experiences. So you, let's, if we compare Nora's experience to ours in high school, where maybe we crammed for a test and we, we might have passed it, but, or maybe we didn't do so well, we couldn't remember everything because we sat down just a few hour for a few hours and then tried to learn everything there was to learn. So as you can see, Nora might have spent four hours total um, 
just as Leanne and Leslie did, but her grade is not going to be that great. It's going to be a C. Leanne, she spent an hour, four hours, but separated out over time, and she made a B. Leslie, who divided her time into half hour increments, but still adding up to four hours, made an A. So the difference between space versus massed practice, massed, spaced out uh, practice, is that students, when introduced to smaller pieces of information over a longer period of time, are able to um, do better on their assessments. In fact, this they do so much better that it results in a 0.65. Now, if you wanted to learn more about uh, space versus mass practice, you can click on that link. And what I like about this is it takes you straight to the Visible Learning MetaX database. And you can see that this these results were gathered as a result of um, studying uh, over 167,000 students. It's based on 510 studies and of course that effect size is there. But you also get to see uh, some of the meta-analyses uh, that uh, Hattie used to, to get at the effect size, the average effect size. So 0.65 is does accelerate student learning it's it's not quite doubling student learning in one year as we might see from maybe another um, strategy that that we'll discuss but you can see that teacher credibility which has an effect size of 1.09 clearly does double or almost triple um, the amount of learning or, or student growth in one calendar year so by putting these some of these uh, strategies to to work in every lesson we can get better results now surface learning um, again is this idea that you're introducing students to concepts skills or strategies and I like to think of it as you're building a strong foundation so strategies here are really sort of introductory and uh, I think about when I facilitate professional learning for adults these strategies fit in quite well with the kinds of, of learning activities that I engage in with adults. But they also work well for introducing students to, f to fresh ideas. One of them that has a particular, particularly uh, high effect size is the jigsaw method. It's, you get an effect size of 1.20, which is about three times the uh, amount of growth in one calendar year for a student. This means that if you use this strategy consistently with your students, you're going to accelerate their learning in, a, in, a, in one year. That's great because we don't want students to sort of just learn one year at a time. We want them to move, to move a little bit faster because students arrive at different levels. Some students may, may be behind grade level or below grade level and others may be ahead, but these strategies help all students do well. Summarization is 0.74, direct instruction 0.59, explicit teaching strategies 0.57, and flipped classrooms which a lot of us are familiar with uh, in EdTech are 0.58. So these strategies allow us to accelerate student learning and let's talk a little bit about the jigsaw method. Uh, my experience with jigsaw was different than what the research described the jigsaw method as. So I'm going to quickly describe it here. Um, so let's say that you have a, a group of 20 students. You're going to you could divide them up into four groups of five or five groups of four. And that but in that initial group, that initial division, let's say four groups of five, that first that group of five, group A, group B, group C, group D, um, that's going to be known as the home group and what students are going to do is essentially divide up into specific areas so they might divide up into different uh, uh, core uh, topics and explore those topics so in, in this case you can see red group all the reds from a particular group go and meet together they discuss their topic all the yellows go together discuss their topic blues and greens together. Each one of these is known as an expert group. And so the expert groups discuss 
their particular facet of a of a overall uh, theme or or issue or topic, and then they reunite and discuss it in their home groups. After they've discussed it with their in their home groups, they'll break up and come back out to the expert groups to discuss what they learned in their home groups. So this is a, a fairly simple process, but it can I've seen the effects myself with uh, adult learners and have seen just incredible results from from them do, going through this. They actually become experts in their particular area and then they're able to share those insights uh, with the rest of their home group. So definitely give it a shot. So that's surface learning. It's a great strategy for um, introducing students to new ideas. But how do we move to deep learning? How do we get students to get, gain a deeper conceptual understanding? And the way to accomplish that is to engage in one of the strategies that's organized for that. Reciprocal teaching is a really powerful strategy for reading comprehension. Uh, classroom discussion, there are lots of different ways to heighten classroom discussion. And you can see outlining and summarizing concept mapping and metacognition strategies. If you look at concept mapping though, one of the key ideas behind concept maps is that uh, students develop their own concept map as they are working their way through content or listening to a direct instruction lesson or working uh, in small groups. The goal here is that students are building their own schema or, con or conceptual understanding of, of an idea and learning how the pieces fit together. This can have, uh, if this has an effect size of 0.64, um, but it doesn't quite work if the teacher sort of maps it out for the students and gives it to them. The goal here is that the students do the mapping themselves. And that's usually true for the outlining and summarizing. And then as we get into transfer learning, um, those strategies still are relevant. But once students have a solid foundation in, in the knowledge and information they need, the core, core ideas, they're going to move into deep learning, gain a deeper conceptual understanding, and then jump into transfer learning. So one of my favorite strategies for transfer learning is problem solving teaching and the reason why is that uh, um, it's actually problem based learning but uh, you notice that when you look at problem solving teaching it has a 0.68 if you looked at problem based learning and tried to do it in maybe the surface learning stage it would be an effect size of 0.15 so not as effective at all but and in uh, transfer learning, when it's done at the appropriate time, um, it has a significant effect size increase. Now, one of the uh, um, other neat strategies here is the strategy to integrate with prior knowledge. And as you can see, this um, strategy has an effect size of 0.93. So the strategy is defined as the idea that readers who establish more connections between a text and their prior knowledge are creating is that cognitive map I mentioned earlier, that schema. And this improves comprehension and recall. Now there's some very easy ways to accomplish this. You want to empower students to acquire, record, organize, synthesize, and remember information. You want to model how to skim, identify relevant information, and take notes. So when I think about the strategy to integrate with prior knowledge, I'm really looking at, I think, a confluence of different strategies that come together. Uh, because you can imagine that outlining and summarizing, note taking, really fall into this piece. And then uh, studying materials for a test, you know, whether we're talking about um, spaced or mass practice or practice uh, testing, uh, all of that also fits in. One easy way to, to achieve this is to use Cornell note taking. And what you can do is make your thinking visible to empower students to do the same. And you want to put a system in place that students are going to be able to use daily. And that's probably why Cornell note taking is such a powerful strategy and one in, in such wide use. There is another approach you can use. Um, we actually have a um, blog entry on this at the TCA Tech Notes blog. Actually we have one on a lot of these strategies. 
and you can um, see that it's intended to facilitate vocabulary uh, learning vocabulary and so definition facts characteristics not examples all of that can be a part of that so how do you match these high effect size strategies to digital tools well we're fortunate uh, Weston Kieschnick uh, came up with a step-by-step -step approach I've modified his approach slightly because I wanted to include uh, Diane Sweeney's instructional coaching tips but uh, I'll leave that for for another discussion so you can see here action step number one you're going to develop and pre-assess learning outcomes what is it that you're going to focus what priority standard Texas essential knowledge and skill are you going to uh, target then your next step is to select your high effect size instructional strategy and so Weston Kieschnick suggests that we ask some questions that are practical you have to consider where are your learners in their learning this is a really important question because it helps situate a learners in surface deep or transfer learning you have to know where every, all your students are and then where are they going what's their next steps and how will they get there so as you're considering your high effect size instructional strategy you need to decide how this is going to happen the next step is to decide on uh, the digital tools and I actually have a chart that I'm going to share with you and I'm not going to go in depth into action steps four and five I just want to quickly call your attention to them and suggest that you may want to uh, read a blog entry at the TCA Tech Notes blog on coaching for results and uh, the coaching for results series there's there's five parts you can come through and it will sort of walk you through the details of all of the um, what I'm sharing with you today but what I want to do is call your attention to deciding on a digital tool because this is this is a uh, a Google Doc a resource that hopefully will sort of support you in aligning um, or matching a high effects size strategy with the digital tool that works so as you can see here we've got the core strategies and different technologies you have a a link to the visible learning meta x the effect size of that and then um, the digital tool that that it works with as well as maybe a G Suite only tool as you come through these you can see there's the jigsaw method summarization direct instruction and most of these have a technology match a digital tool that you can use that's going to uh, enhance the effect of that particular strategy so all of this is available online and you are certainly welcome to use it and explore the chart is here that you can take advantage of and um, if you want to explore what this might look like let's say for reciprocal teaching um, you can actually also see a chart on that matches the strategies and you can get your own copy that's the same chart I just shared with you but this will sort of hopefully introduce you to matching digital tools with evidence-based strategies thanks for uh, listening to this particular episode and I hope that that uh, you'll reach out and make contact remember uh, my name is Miguel Gulen and you can reach me at MG Learn, or of course you can visit the TCA Tech Notes blog. Now, if you would like to sort of see this in a recent blog entry, um, at least one that was published in April uh, 2020, look for uh, Napkin PD PBL Your Jigsaw. I had a lot of fun with this particular session uh, because it allowed me to combine. Um, all of these different factors into a workshop session and so it will cover a lot of the different ideas and topics and it may also serve as a way for you to share this with other uh, educators that you may have that the opportunity to work with remember you can find uh, more sessions at tca.org forward slash remote learning thanks for listening